So we talked about uh, greenhouse heating, greenhouse cooling. Today I want to talk a little bit about uh, greenhouse control technology. And then um, on Thursday we're going to talk about integrating everything together and how to make keep your climate control system and your greenhouse running smoothly. In the, when greenhouses were first started using greenhouses, probably for centuries, uh, greenhouse climate control was based upon human intervention. And most greenhouses uh, uh, that were growing commercial crops, before we used thermostats and climate control devices, uh, we had a night watchman or somebody that all they would did all day long was go through the greenhouses, check the temperature, open valves, close valves, uh, close vents in the afternoons. And as a consequence, we had a lot of temperature fluctuations. The, the temperature would go really cold at night or really warm during the day. And we didn't have a lot of, we, we didn't have a lot of precision in pushing out a crop at the right time. So here we have a picture of, uh, of, a, of a vent, roof vent. Uh, here we've got a picture from Perk um, where we've got these manual vents. In many ways, I still like having a few manual vents in my greenhouse uh, if I had the best of all worlds so I didn't have to rely on electricity for everything. So I could open the, grant, open the vents and close the vents if in the event of a uh, heating failure or cooling failure or something like that. The most simple form of heating control technology is a thermostat. And we've all been around thermostats in your homes, thermostats in your houses and apartments. And the simplest thermostat out there is what's called a bimetallic coil. Now bimetallic coils are the cheapest, they're the most economical, but they're not very accurate. And when you use a bimetallic coil, um, it's got a, a little uh, strip inside that expands or contracts in, in response to temperature changes and opens and closes the circuit. Um, it's the simplest and since it just works one, one circuit, it only controls one device. Thermostat controls, um, if you have a series of thermostats controlling a series of different kinds of equipment, uh, you can't, it's hard to coordinate your equipment. They set one thermostat at one temperature, another thermostat at another temperature, another thermostat at another temperature to turn and control things. But um, it's oftentimes not very accurate, not very efficient. You can get some fancier therm thermostats that are multi-staged. In other words, they have another set of switches inside. They have multiple switches inside. They open and close at different, uh, thermo uh, different um, temperatures. But again, they're factory set and it's typical. It's sometimes hard to adjust those. And um, it's, it's a challenge sometimes if you're using multiple single point thermostats to control, for instance, a set of fans or maybe the heating system. Oftentimes you'll have overlap of technology and you don't want to be running your fans and your heating system at the same time, not normally. So thermostats are probably the most commonly used but um, and used quite often, but they're not very accurate. And they do require frequent calibration because oftentimes just because it's got a number on there that's 70 degrees Fahrenheit doesn't mean it's opening and closing at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So they have to be calibrated. And like I said, the bimetallic strip, uh, here's another diagram of the bimetallic strip. And this is a pretty sophisticated one. We've got a, a coil, well, a U-shaped bimetallic strip, and it it's basically set as a spring, and that spring uh, tension is adjusted by the temperature. It's got a pivot point, so it rocks back and forth. We have uh, a set of points, and the points, whether it opens or closes, turns or turns off, a device. Now this is a bi, a di, a bi, a twin pole thermostat, dual pole thermostat. So it's got a set point where it's not touching either pole. It moves to the left it contacts that pole, moves to the right, contacts another pole. So it can turn equipment on and off. It's uh, the, the dial up here on the top, now this is real common, is it, actually a cam, and the cam adjusts the tension on the coil as you set it. And like I said, they're not very accurate, they're mechanical devices. Um, they work pretty well. Uh, another part of that, uh, probably a little more accurate from the bimetallic strip, is a liquid or gas-filled coil, and these are oftentimes, you see them as a bu remote bulb going to another, inside a cooler or something like that. And 
as the liquid expands or contracts inside that bulb, opens or closes the switch. So for instance, this thermostat here, this coil on top, actually has a, a liquid in it that expands or contracts with, and pushes a, a piston back and forth that opens or closes the switch. Here's one with a remote bulb, and this is a coil of tubing, and it's a, it's a flexible tubing, typically copper. As long as you don't crimp it, it works very well, and a lot of people will use these for root zone heating systems. I'll put this bulb in your soil bed so you can monitor your temperature in soil bed if you're going to use a heating mat for germinating seed or something like that. A little bit of a thought on switches. I used the word double pole a minute ago. So what this technology, when you look in catalogs and stuff, you'll see things listed as SP or DP. That refers to single pole or double pole. Now what single pole means is it opens and closes one circuit. Single pole double throw means that it's got two different sides. It can open or close the circuit on the right or open or close the circuit on the left. Double pole single throw, of course, just opens or closes a pair of poles at the same time. Double pole double throw. And these are used for different kinds of devices. For instance, a double pole single throw would be typical for a um, 220, 220 volt fan that uses two hot leads because you don't want to just break one lead because you only want to don't want power running to your fan when it's off. A double pole double throw might uh, turn on a set of fans or might turn on a um, heating system uh, as it goes the other direction, depending on how it goes back or forth. So here, just like a simple uh, wiring diagram. Uh, this is for a baseboard heater in a house, or, but think of this as your heating device. And we <coughs> supply, uh, in normal 110 volt wiring, we supply ground and a neutral to this, and we break and we switch, using the thermostat, the power or the hot lead, okay? Another kind of switch that we use uh, in greenhouses or in thermostats is called a mercury switch. And a mercury switch is sometimes used as that, it's uh, attached to that bi-metallic coil, goes back and forth, and the mercury in there is actually, as it's put on a pivot point, rocks or opens or closes the circuit. And a little demonstration of a mercury switch. It's a real comp complicated. In this particular one, it's got the contact points to the right. And when the mercury comes in contact with the contact points, it um, completes the circuit. And mercury switches are still very, very common. Um, a lot of devices have mercury switches. And I know people think that mercury is pretty dangerous, but as long as it's in that glass tube, it's safe. But it's a, it's, since it's liquid at uh, uh, operating temperatures, so um, thermostats are basically a temperature sensing, a mechanically, uh, senses temperature mechanically and changes in response to the temperature, either whether it's a bimetallic strip or gas or something like this. When you get into electronics, we start to use uh, uh, another set of products, and one product is called a thermistor. Now, a thermistor is a solid state chip that um, generates an output voltage, and that output voltage uh, changes, the, the thermistor, the technology itself, changes in relationship to the temperature. So we can monitor those changes in voltage with the microprocessor. The good thing about a thermistor is they're much, much more accurate than the uh, a temperature sensing device that uses a thermistor is much more accurate than a temperature sensing device like um, a mechanical thermostat. Thermocouples, uh, thermocouples are a little more inexpensive than thermistors and what they, a thermocouple is is two dissimilar wires, two metal, two wires of dissimilar metals fused together and when we fuse those two wires together, they generate a current. And it's a microvolt current. And the current that goes through that junction, the amount of microvolts output by the two dissimilar metals is, again, in direct linear proportion 
with temperature. And they, you can monitor those flow rates of that current to change the temperature. And they're cheaper than thermistors, but you have to have a thermistor in your system for a reference point. A lot of times we use thermistor, uh, thermocouples in data loggers and such as that, so we can put them a lot more out because you could just make them in the shop. So one of the things that we do to uh, get away from multiple thermostats to, re to, to control multiple equipments is we use a device called a step controller. And um, step controller you still use as a thermostat or a thermistor or a thermocouple or something like that to measure the temperature in the greenhouse. But, and some of them actually have a humidistat. They don't cost a whole lot of money. They cost $800 to $2,000. And what they do is they control um, our devices in stages. And so for instance, uh, for a night temperature, we'll set a set point at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And th the device then is programmed with a set of relays. It's got a sensor that measures the temperature. That if, it draw if the temperature falls two degrees, and you can set these, if it falls two degrees, like to 58 degrees, is your, it will turn on half your heating system. And if it drops another two degrees to 56 degrees, it turns on the whole heating system because the first, just half the heating system wasn't quite there to provide enough BTUs to keep the greenhouse warm, okay? If the temperature was to rise above the set point, for instance, if we were looking, uh, we would probably have the set point set to turn on the lowest level of cooling or a winter cooling exhaust fan and maybe just cracking a vent open, it would turn on at 75. Well, if it's really hot and it's starting to get even warmer, we'll click kick into the summer gear, summer cooling, and what it'll do is it'll turn on more exhaust fans and open more vents, and then if it still requires more cooling, if it hits 80 degrees, it'll uh, hit the exhaust fans, pads, cooling pads, and such as that. As the temperature then drops, the cooling pad will turn off and the fans will stay on. If it drops, it'll just stage itself down. And this is what we call a step controller. It controls different uh, materials in different steps or different <coughs> stages. What step controllers do when, versus controlling a set, of thermostat, a set of thermostats is that it's just one device monitoring everything and controlling everything. And it conserves energy and fuel. We have tighter control of our temperature fluctuations. And since it's just one controller, we're not going to have equipment overlap. And of course, they cost a lot, cost, uh, they're cheaper to install. If you have to do a whole bank of thermostats to control a whole bank of fans and different devices, uh, if the thermostats cost 50 bucks to 100 bucks a piece, and you've got eight or nine thermostats, all of a sudden you've spent more money than it would cost to buy one step controller. So the uh, step 50 that we saw at Perk on our walking tour, that was the basic step controller that first came out. And uh, as you can see, it's got a night dial and a, a, on, on the left and a, a, a day dial on the left, a night dial on the right. And it's got a series of uh, two heating points and three cooling points. And what they do is they control a set of relays. And those relays then go to what's called a contactor panel because these little bitty relays don't have enough uh, capacity to carry the voltage, to carry the amp load of a, of a heating fan, so they control things are on and off. The Enviro step uh, over here on the far right, that is the uh, ultimate in what uh, uh, Wadsworth has designed. And of course, then they have, this is called a step-up controller. This is a, a smaller version that they just came out, uh, came out with. So step control, again, 58 degrees, it could turn on heat. Temperature con continues to glide, turns on the rest of the equipment, and uh, so forth. So programs things and runs things in steps. The next level up from a step controller is what we call a limited, uh, is a dedicated microprocessor. And what a dedicated microprocessor is, is basically a small computer. Small computers are everywhere. Uh, we've got uh, small computers in just about every device that's out there these days. And of course, they cost more money. You can control up to 40 devices. They, the 
a micro dedicated microprocessor would be like the step 40 that we saw. Uh, actually, an Envirus step system is a, is a dedicated micro uh, microprocessor as well. They typically have a graphics display, and they control more systems. And t what the uh, manufacturers do is they design in different equipment codes for steam valves, fans, cooling fans, vent motors, um, all your different pieces of equipment. So you don't have to figure those out, and they're already put in there. So they can control light, shading, etc. So again, a dedicated microprocessor. And, and um, for instance, when the MicroStep came out, it had a more sophisticated microprocessor in it than the Space Shuttle had. I mean, the Space Shuttle was all uh, x86 computer processors, believe it or not, because they've been around for so long. So um, just more sophisticated, more power, more zones, more units, um, so forth. So the next step up is when we go to computer control design. Now, what a computer we computer control system is, is it different than a dedicated microprocessor? Actually, no. When we talk about computer control, we're using a computer, a personal computer, or an Apple computer, or whatever, that's all wired into one central point, and we're controlling it from a central point. So we ex the ability to expand dedicated microprocessors for each zone allows for remote access and display, manage your environmental data, take records, keep records, switch logs, equipment logs. One of the good things is to know is how on and how many times a piece of equipment, how many hours it's run, you can record that kind of data so you can manage your technology. Um, Wadsworth is one system. Uh, the Priva system uh, is written about in your textbook. Uh, Priva is a uh, Dutch uh, system. Um, the Priva and the Argus systems are a little more sophisticated in that they have the capacity to also include and integrate uh, nutrient management. They have technologies that they, they sell to control your hydroponics for tomatoes, and they have uh, instrumentation that can monitor the exact nutrients that are going in your system. So a central computer system is basically working with remotes. Um, most of them are wired. Some of them are moving more and more to wireless systems. Uh, the QCOM technology actually uses um, uh, signal over power. Um, for instance, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever uh, hooked up your network system in your apartment. You can plug it into your outlet and put your power into, uh, put your data signal over your 110 volt line. Um, but it controls lots more different things. Uh, it also allows you to monitor your boiler or put separate sophistication controls on your boiler and such as that. So when we use computer control, we start thinking of control logics, and I call it PID. And uh, PID is, stands for uh, promotion, proportional control, integra integral control, and differential control. Now P, proportional control, is the most um, limited level of control that you can think about. It's just opening or closing a switch based upon a response on need, changes in temperatures, or deviation from a single set point. So that simple thermostat is opening or closing a switch based upon changes in temperature. Integral control, rather than just um, looking at proportional control, open or closing it, we're looking at time, like maybe time of day. Like you might have one set of uh, temperature set points for nighttime and another set of temperature set points for daytime, which is always the case because our nighttime temperatures, we want them to be cooler than our daytime temperatures. And in fact, most crop settings in a greenhouse are based upon the nighttime temperature. And we base our daytime temperature on temperatures plus 10 or plus 15, depending on the species. Differential control, this is where you have a computer. We're taking the temperature and time, you know, the temp change in the set point temperature, time of day, et cetera. We're looking upon including things like rates of change. So we need to start putting in predictive models into our climate control system. For instance, 
if you have a weather station outside and the temperature is changing over the day on a normal normal pattern, the sun comes up, it's a clear sky, the sun goes down, gets cold, but if all of a sudden a cloud or storm comes in, the wind picks up and the light level goes down, you could have a whole other set of parameters plugged into your computer to say, okay, the wind is coming up, I need to prepare my greenhouse for a cold snap, shut down the vents, re-fire the boiler earlier or start to preheat the greenhouse to take into account a response time. Now this means that you've got to sit down and program your computer a little bit, but it's nothing more similar than thinking about what the climate is in your particular zone. Argus, com Argus uh, Climate Control Computer Systems, in fact, their, their systems are so sophisticated that when you buy an Argus Climate Control Computer, you're not, only, you're not just buying the system, you're buying a service because they have a server up in Vancouver and they, they, that server goes and looks at your computer every day and analyzes the daily data and it automatically goes in and refines the equipment responses to make sure that you're saving as much energy as possible. However, most of us deal with a more basic system and um, where we're looking at the standard schematic for a stage or a step control system. So this particular example, I've got an overhead heating system. I have a floor heating system. And I've got a set point. I have horizontal airflow fans. I have roof vents. One set of exhaust fans. Second set of exhaust fans. <coughs> got my vent openings for my pads and then I got my pad pumps. So this is a standard set of operating equipment for most greenhouses. The floor heat could be perimeter heat or it could be uh, a, another set of heating system. So we design our set points. I've got a couple of different conditions. I have maximum heat, minimum heat, air circulation, minimum ventilation, maximum ventilation, evaporative cooling, maybe I want to just humidify my greenhouse, dehumidify my greenhouse, I've got a wind event where the wind outside is blowing hard, or I've got a freezing rain or something like that. So I can control most of the climate control systems from the Wadsworth through the most sophisticated Argus system with this kind of stuff. So if it's just maximum heat, if I'm requiring the maximum amount of heat, I'm going to turn on my overhead heat, my floor heat, and my HAF fans. Got circulation, got my floors going, got my heating system going. In fact, this is the schematic for the university greenhouses. Minimum heat, I'm just turning on the floor fan, I'm not turning on the overhead circulation. HAF fans, I want to run those, especially when I'm just running the floor heat, so I have air movement and no cold pockets. If I'm at the set point, of course, nothing is running, right? Make sense? All right, it's starting to get warm. I'm going to open a vent and turn a fan on. Or I might open a vent and then turn a fan on, depending on how many stages I want. Still getting warm, I'm going to turn all my fans on, and I'm going to open the, the uh, side vents, but I'm closing the roof vents, OK? So the roof vents have got to be closed because I want to pull air across the greenhouse. Still getting warm. Now I'm going to turn the pad pumps on. I've got all fans running and my pad pumps. Temperature starts to fall. Greenhouse is cooling off. Pad pumps turn on. The inlet vents are still open. And it, it'll step itself back down. Now I've programmed in some other some other parameters here. Let's say that I want to humidify my greenhouse. I want it a little more humid in there. I can set that up either to turn my pad pumps on, but that means it's going to be humid right next to the pad pumps, or I can connect that up to a um, fog system. Maybe a, uh, a fog system for propagation or, or for doing plugs. If I want to dehumidify, turn on my HAF fans, and open my vent a little bit. 
I might even consider turning a heater on if I want to dehumidify a little faster. In fact, what the old rose growers used to do is they used to crack their vents as the sun was going down and turn on the heating system early to dry the greenhouse out and they used that for control of powdery mildew. They would spend fuel rather than spend money on labor and fungicides. And depending on what the fuel cost is and the cost of your labor and cost of whether or not you want to use fungicides or not, depends on whether you do that, that, that system. Typically the fuel is cheaper than labor. High wind, everything is, all the vents are closed and I'm turning on my exhaust fans, pulls a little bit of vacuum on the greenhouse, and maybe hold my roof on a little longer. Freezing temperatures, or if we got snow on the roof, I'm going to turn on the overhead heat to melt the roof, melt the snow off the roof. So this is an example of how the staging or step control technology works for controlling a greenhouse system. And the idea is, this is a chart where we've got a blue line, is, which is our set point for our cooling system, and the red line is our set point for our heating system. And as you can see, I would like to keep that fluctuation as tight as possible. And you can see during the daylight hours up here on top, that's harder to do that because the, you can see the sun going behind the clouds or you can see this uh, basically because this is 12 noon right smack in the middle of this graph and you can see in the afternoon and as it starts to shut down around 4 o'clock you can watch your temperature. So the idea is to keep that as tight as possible. The closer you put the blue and the red lines together, the more frequent your equipment is going to turn on and off. And we call it cycling. The more you cycle your equipment, it puts more wear and tear on your belts and your motors and your fans and such like that. So what most growers will try to do is try to spread those, those uh, set points out to a level within, that's acceptable for good plant growth, but yet not overrunning their equipment. So some cost saving things that you can do. Um, and this is an example from your textbook, actually from Colorado Springs. And this is actually Pikes Peak Greenhouses. I know exactly where this came from. Um, but you can see this, how the set points change with energy curtains and not energy curtains and looking at your heating cost. So what it involves in designing your control system, the first thing you need, to one of the, an additional thing you need to think about is where do you put the sensor? The most appropriate place to put the sensor is where the plants are. At the plant height, you want it in an area where the HF fans can move enough air, but it's, it's where the plants are is what's most important. An engineer is always tempted to put that sensor up in the airflow. And by putting it in the airflow, uh, they get a tighter line. It makes them look like they're a better designer. But I want it at the plant height. I don't want it in the currents of the air currents for the heating and cooling system. And I'm going to put it near the center of the greenhouse. Now, another th important thing about your temperature sensors is they're going to be powered with an electrical signal. Now, if you just take a thermostat that's wired directly to a fan, either 110 volts or 220 volts, we don't want that voltage at plant height. Because if you hit that with a water hose and then grab hold of it, you have a dead employee. Plain and simple. So we never put anything in a greenhouse, no power in a greenhouse at plant height more than 24 volts. That's actually code and good sense. So we use a 24 volt sensor that goes and controls that fan through a relay. Sensors that can be linked to equipment, uh, the temperature sensor of course, relative humidity, light intensity, carbon dioxide levels, uh, irrigation sensors. Um, there are technologies out there that have, you can put a sensor in a pot that it can see how much water it needs. And in fact, Dr. Bowerly 
and our department is working with a, a group of researchers across the United States where they're designing irrigation control technologies based upon uh, soil moisture and the model of the plant. They've got working with an experimental nursery here at CSU out at the Hort Farm plus another uh, example out in Ohio. We can monitor our nutrients, injection systems. We can also monitor the exterior weather, which is something you need to make sure you do. This aspirated sensor box is the old design that we used to use for years and years and years, where we have a bank of thermostats inside a box that's painted white. We use white paint in greenhouses because it's the most reflective. Uh, it gives the most best reflection. And it's aspirated in that we have a little, little fan here on the left and an air opening. So we're pulling air through that box all the time. Even the modern asp sensor boxes, the little plastic ones we hang from the roof in the greenhouses, have a fan in them to move the air through it. So this particular example has got three thermostats. Each thermostat controls a single function. And we need to use the box to shield the, the thermostat from solar radiation. Because if it's exposed to solar radiation, it's just going to heat from the sun, and it's not going to be reflective of the temperature in the greenhouse. In fact, when you walk in a greenhouse, and you think it's cold or you think it's warm because of the way you feel, is irrelevant. You need to monitor the temperature at the plant height to know what the temperature of the plants are. Because you're growing plants, not making a climate environment for your employees. So this is an, uh, a Wadsworth aspirated sensor box. Um, it uh, has uh, a temperature sensor, a humidistat. It's got a little fan. And the plastic box shields it from radiation. Another thing to remember when you're hanging products like this from the roof is always make sure you put a coil loop of wire below the box. In fact, this is something you should do every, with every device you ever run. What happens is, if you have the coiled loop, if there's water coming down, dripping down this coil from condensate or something like that, it'll drip off the bottom of the coil and not drip into the, into the box. Uh, if you've ever used an electric fryer or something like that in your kitchen or something like that, if you don't let that coil below the level, you could drip water into the fry, fryer and have a, a little bit of a nasty mess in your kitchen. So this is just good school thought to always make sure that your wire hangs below your device. If you've got an extension cord outside uh, running some Christmas lights, make sure the wire is below the point so you don't get water running into your device. Um, here, this picture in the top left is very simple. Um, we have a 24 volt um, uh, Simple bimetallic uh, thermostat here on the right for the for the heating units, and then we've got a heavier duty. This is probably for the fans, and since it's got steel conduit, I'm pretty certain that that's got live voltage running through it. Not something that I would do, not something that I would design, but you see it all the time. I would prefer that everybody uses a 24 volt current when you're in the greenhouse. It's much safer. Um, Here's an, uh, another enclosure. Here's the enclosure on the left. Here's the enclosure for the um, EnviroStep system. And this is the enclosure on the right, lower right, for the Priva system. One of the main differences that you can see in the Priva single zone system and the Wadsworth single zone system is the Wadsworth has a set of toggle switches. This has got a little key panel that you have to search through to turn equipment on or off. And I just particularly. I'm more fond of something that I can control a little easier. And they all have relays and circuit boards and such as that. So some of the common ones, Argus controls, they're pretty much the Cadillac system. They design technologies for um, heating, cooling, boiler management, irrigation control, fertilizer control. It does, they can make a system to do anything you can imagine. Priva is about the same, but it's from Holland and a little more expensive. They have many, many levels of controls you can get. QCOM 
is a company that co comes in and out of favor. It was, uh, QCOM was one of the first climate control systems come out using the signal over the electrical power line as long as they could, didn't have to have wires running all over the greenhouse, <coughs> which is something that's quite uh, useful. Wadsworth Controls, um, they're located here in uh, Arvada, Colorado. You can get modeling programs, software programs, and one of the things that's most important about these computer control systems is to collect the data, but don't collect the data and let it sit. You need to collect the data and look at it and see where you can make your equipment run better, run more efficiently, so that you can take advantage of this technology. Uh, for instance, you can even swap uh, relays to make fans. Maybe what some people will do is they'll take the high-speed fans, and the high-cooling fans, and low-cooling fans and swap them every year just to spread out the wear and tear on the motors and such as that. The other thing that's really important about um, climate control systems is uh, I prefer, the Wadra systems will do this, all the systems will do this, they'll have an alarm here, an alarm uh, mode, where if a piece of equipment goes offline, if a temperature extreme is exceeded, high or low, it sets off an alarm. Now that's great. I prefer a system that's actually separate from the climate control system. Now why I like separate is I like backup. And it's a personal preference, but uh, I think uh, most people feel the same way. And uh, where we use auto dialers, and this is an old auto dialer system. We still use them everywhere. And what it does is if I've, the one we've got programmed out at PERC, that if there's a power failure, or if there's a flame out on the boiler, or if there's a temperature extreme in one of the greenhouses that I've got it set, it dials my phone. And it either dials, if it, I don't pick up my office phone, it dials my cell phone. If I don't pick up my cell phone, it deals, dials my house phone. It doesn't pick up the house phone, it calls the steam plant. Steam plant here at CSU actually has their own automated system too. They usually beat me there. So that's a good thing here at CSU. But uh, having a uh, automated temperature alarm system is uh, critical when, especially when you're planning on paying bills with that poinsettia crop or that lily crop and it's below zero outside. So. It's important that your sensors are shielded. Um, they have to have uh, air across them, 600 feet per minute. We're going to put our sensors, uh, paint them in reflective color cover or something like that, usually white. A lot of growers will use a mechanical mix, minimum and maximum thermometer to make sure their technology is calibrated correctly. Calibration is crucial. These are electrical devices. Just because it says that it's 70 degrees at the factory doesn't mean it's actually 70 degrees. I like to, to calibrate my devices with a mercury thermometer because they're the most accurate. Weather stations are important and what this weather station, this particular one, has a weather vane that tells me the direction of the wind, which I need to know whether I want to open or close the vents at a certain area at time. It's got a uh, anemometer, and the anemometer is responsible for measuring the wind speed, so I need to know how fast that wind is gusting across my greenhouse. For instance, when we're doing our heating and cooling calculations, that wind is going to impact how hard our boiler needs to work, how hard our heating system needs to work. This particular device has also got a radiometer, and a radiometer is a full spectrum light sensor. It measures the light intensity in, in either joules per meter squared or watts per square foot. And what that tells me is the amount of energy that's coming into my greenhouse. That's not photosynthetic energy, that's the entire spectrum. Foot candles is the visual spectrum. We'll talk about light a little later, probably after spring break. So I, I want to have a full spectrum so I know what the, how much light I'm getting. Because some, uh, especially vegetable growers, tomato growers, they actually program their irrigation rates based upon the accumulated joules of light. And they'll also program their CO2 output for the accumulated joules of light. Because if it's cloudy out, there's no point in running CO2. It's a waste of money. This one also has a precipit, it's called a precipitation detector. It's just a little device that lets it know that there's water forming on the surface. That means it's either raining or snowing. 
So that's good to know.